All right. Welcome once again to MCC Campus Connections. We are recording from our downtown location at at LaSalle, uh, 203 North LaSalle. And you can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts. You can contact us at at podcast at mccollege.edu. We look forward to hearing from you. And today we have, we're going to do things a little bit different today. So we have with us Shouty Martinez, who's going to be our co-host for today. Welcome, Shouty. How are you? Oh, good. Super excited again. <laughs> yeah, you were a previous guest on one of our episodes. So you are yes. you obviously liked it and wanted to come back and do it again. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Wonderful. And we have Ryan Mutter, who is our uh, international admissions manager. And you're fairly new to MCC, correct? Yeah, as of last November. So, last November has been that long already. <laughs> oh yes, it's like with the new year, it just goes by really fast. So. Yeah. Oh, since last year, yeah. wonderful. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> first of all, I'm excited to have both of you. So, we're going to do a little bit, you know, things. This this podcast will be a little bit different because we have three people instead of just two. Mm-hmm. Uh, from the international, <laughs> I know. Yeah, from the interna- international <laughs> team. Uh huh. Uh, so we'll get started uh, getting to know Ryan a little bit more since you're the uh, our latest edition mm-hmm. and you're not from the Midwest, which is I, I always find that fascinating Yeah, <laughs> when I speak to people that are not from the Midwest. So you're from so South Dakota, no- oh, South Dakota, yeah, yeah. Originally North Dakota. I'm not from like Chicago. So like for us, it's like that <clears throat> the other Midwest. Right. So. Yeah, originally from South Dakota, from a small town called Avon. Uh, I always call it the village because it's probably about 500 or so people. Nice. Most people live in the countryside. Of course, you know, there's the actual town center itself. But yeah, and I was there for at least good 19, 20 years of my life. Okay. So, I mean, it's a small community, rural farm community. Um, your school is basically kindergarten, preschool, all the way to senior year. So that's basically my educational background for my early youth. Right? Wow. Do you still have connections with uh, the people you went to school oh, yeah. with? I mean, like a few people I still talk to or know of, or I at least know of them. Rather it be like through word of mouth, fa- social media, Facebook, of mm-hmm. course. Right. But even like when you go back, I haven't been home home for a while. But like I know if I go back there, people probably know me. Mm-hmm. versus if I don't remember them just because since it's such a small community, very close knit, most people know you by your last name. They probably know your parents or like people in your family background. It's like one of those situations where everyone knows each other. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's a very like uh, familiar place. Do you find that people who's, who live in small towns stay in small towns Usually, for the most part? Yeah, so like I know in the past... Like, think of my parents' age. It was more common to stay in a small town or stay in the state. But I know, like, in my experience, most people, like, for example, my class, majority have stayed in the state because that's just a trend. If people don't stay in the small town, they go to, like, the larger city, like Sioux Falls, maybe Rapid City for school, work, employment opportunities. Um, That is a trend, right? But looking back, I think back home, home in, like, the Avon, it's more of um, there's still people there, but I think that most people nowadays, once they finish high school, they do tend to move. Or if they stay, they might stay for like um, family farms, agricultural. Maybe they have a connection. So yeah, I was about to to ask the same thing yeah. because my reference are the movies, uh-huh. you know, and we always see that oh, people from small towns. They always dream to get out of there. That kind of was, yeah, that would have been, that was a dream at one point. But like, again, it's not the common dream of most people. Like even in my senior year, I mean, it's very common for people to go to either one of the two state colleges, either they go to USD, University of South Dakota, or they go to SESU, South Dakota State University, where I went, Mm -hmm. right? If they don't go to those two state colleges, they'll go to maybe a specialty college or they might go out of state, um, it's like at least a good 90% probably stay in state. And how do you get out of there? 
it depends on you. I mean, people I know that maybe went out of state probably had a scholarship. Um, some neighboring states like Minnesota usually have a deal with us. So we're considered in-state tuition. I almost went to University of Minneapolis or Minnesota. Um, okay. They had an offer or a deal. There was a place in like Marshall, Minnesota, Southwest Minnesota University. They also do in-state tuition. So that would be one opportunity. And if someone didn't do that, I mean, it's a different situation. Maybe they did something else or they had something else they could use to go out of state. But generally it's like in-state only. But So your transition from Avon, Mm -hmm. which is a smaller um, town, to when you went to university, what what was that transition like? So uh, I always like make the reference, I kept going up and up and up and up, right? So SDSU is Brookings, South Dakota. It's more of a, to me, it's still more like a farm town, but since it has that university, it's more of a college town, Mm -hmm. right? The population goes from like 500, like I had in Avon, to about maybe 16,000 because of the university. Um, So it is like a small adjustment. And I always think at first when I go to a bigger place or biggest, bigger city or new city, it feels like it's bigger, but after a while, it seems like it's still a small town mm-hmm. to me, right? Like the last time I was in Brookings, I can still remember the streets. It doesn't feel like it's that big. Of course, if you go off like a uh, college course season or whatever, it's less people because most people leave. So it goes from like 16,000 to like what, maybe 8,000 when school's not in session. Or like the summer break. Yeah. Those numbers <laughs> for me are like, what? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a big thing. Like, I remember always in like a summer or like in August when school starts up, like there's this group of people just coming and you can't really go shopping anywhere because it's so busy. There's so many people coming in. People are moving. Um, a very common Midwestern thing is like when your child is going to university, mm-hmm. you take them to university, you help them move. Mm-hmm. It's like a family thing, right? always someone's crying because like it's the first last, time uh, yeah, yeah. Is your first time or is the last time <laughs> yeah but for those three days it's always busy right even when i worked for international students mm-hmm. maybe my second or third year um i'd help international students at my university kind of hey welcome to your new school welcome to a new cultural setting part of the orientation exactly so yeah and then we would do pre-orientation um helping them adjust because it's not going to be very similar or Maybe what they knew in movies is a little bit different because exactly. I can't really think of an accurate movie or series that depicts my uh, home other than like Western romance movies, which aren't even <laughs> accurate because, I mean, that's a Hallmark long time ago. Movies. Yeah, Hallmark. like Wild Bill. <laughs> but for international students, it's different because yeah. probably they don't have their parents here. Exactly. So they are alone. So things that if yeah. you help them, it's good to have that orientation at that time because yep. it's totally new, new country, new college, new everything. Yeah. So. And that's like always having to have these like small communities of international friends. So like I've been in some groups here and there, like help people find a group so they can connect with someone, especially like think about the holidays, right? Oh, Most yes. people leave, Birthdays, but they can't. They're the hardest yeah. ones. Or like, you know, holidays yeah. and maybe things you celebrated back home or in your culture. Like that's yeah. something I always try to like help get people involved or like find that connection. Right. And that's where a lot of my friends kind of came from in that mm-hmm. background, too. So that gave me more of that cultural insight because like back home when I was growing up in the village, I mean, it's not very diverse. Like, yeah, we have TV, we have the Internet, but like you don't actually experience multicultural Correct. things until you actually get involved or meet people. Mm-hmm. Right. I think so. I don't know if you have the same same experience, but when I was in Venezuela, I didn't have any contact with international people mm-hmm. at all. So I was in my town, in my city, in my car. I yeah. mean, all my friends were from my my neighborhood. So yeah, like once I leave the country, I really start to understand and learn and connect and appreciate the differences yeah. and similarities. But I didn't have any contact with international people. Well, even like in my home, like homeschool, like in my uh, Avon, I mean, we'd get occasionally like one international student. But I always kind of felt kind of strange for them because like, okay, you came from Norway, you came from Spain, you came from Korea to like 
this small farm town <laughs> probably had no idea what you get into because yes. they probably went through like some sort of like an agency or a company and then they just send them Correct. like welcome <laughs> but no most of them had fun i mean like i don't think i don't know of any of that a bad experience but i think it's a very different experience than you would maybe have thought of when you started yep so is uh college a little bit more or the university was a, was that a little bit more diverse or was it still mainly people from south dakota or so south dakota north dakota sdsu was more diverse because of course you have like your typical like midwestern south dakotans here but then you also have like an international community because uh, the university kind of specializes in agricultural studies nursing studies so some of my international friends were probably more in agricultural or they're doing maybe a STEM kind of college situation. Mm-hmm. I had a friend in Columbia and she studied bees, which is really interesting mm-hmm. because I didn't know we had an actual like department for that. And like, think of the Smithsonian, like they have all those um, like specimen samples of bees and mm-hmm. that was in my university. So I got to see that. Oh, That's wow. cool. I had a friend from both Mexico and Bolivia they did a lot of agricultural stuff. So they're doing like testing different kind of seeds and planting, which again, agricultural state is what we use for that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah, it was a nice like opportunity to learn more of the international side or like it's more diverse than just what I had at home. So what was it that you originally wanted to study once you got to, <laughs> <laughs> to the university? So I'm one of those classic, you know, I changed my major a few times. Um, Tell me more. <laughs> And so it's like students are like, what? Anyways, uh, initially when I went to, entered SDSU, I was biology major because in high school, I mean, okay. I did well in biology. I liked it. I understood the material. I'm like, okay, this could be an opportunity. Um, so my first year I did biology, which was okay, right? But I knew about my second semester of my freshman year. I'm like, hey, um, a little bit different than what I had in my school for education because the chemistry and the physics mm. are more advanced. Uh, not doing as well. So at some point I kind of had to make a decision that was more like, okay, you know, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I'm not doing too well. Uh, in my university, they kind of have your first year, you have like a, like a buddy system of some sort. I don't remember the name of it, but they kind of help you when it comes to, okay, you're not maybe academically performing well in certain classes. Here's some study groups. Here's what you can do, which, you know, I took advantage, but at some point it's like, okay, this, this is not going to work for me because Mm -hmm. I'm not doing as well as I did, which is culture shock in my sense. Like, okay, education from home was very focused on test taking because that was the trend at the time to go to university and understand like, okay, what you study and learn here is not test taking. It changes your whole perspective. So basically I know my following semester, I took a semester off because they give you the option to like, okay, you can take a break and come back next semester, which I did. And so after that came back, I believe I chose park management because my state's known for, you know, natural parks, state parks, et cetera. I worked at a state park briefly as well during the break. Okay. Um, Switched my major to park management. And then that following to us, it's spring semester, despite it's winter, there were some budget cuts. So that program was then canceled. So option Next option is like, okay, well, I mean, I'm already going to start semester. I switched to undecided, which undecided is basically you do your general requirements. Mm -hmm. You take a class to kind of discover yourself, right? Which at first it sounded kind of silly to take a class like that and pay Mm -hmm. college credit for that. But it's the same class that helped me realize, okay, you know, you do well at teaching. You do at languages. You have opportunities. There's something you explore, which I did. And that's where I changed to like more international studies, right? Um, and then eventually when I started that for the following semester, I decided to do more kind of more languages since I had more backgrounds in that. Um, we have an opportunity to take a placement test, which is very familiar around most schools. When you take a language course, you take a placement to see where you're at. I had taken German prior. I didn't really feel like I wouldn't continue with German because again, at that time, I mean. It's a hard one. It is. And it also is like Spanish is more common and more practical, right? I had taken two years in high school. So when I decided, let's try Spanish, took a placement test. And I got basically intermediate, which is about B1, B2. Good. And the other nice like convenience of that was at my university, um, there is a deal where you can basically buy the credits for all the lower levels to fast track your degree, which is convenient because at that time, I don't want to stay longer because it can be more expensive. 
And at that point, like, okay, we'll continue with it. Did Spanish, and that was my further kind of choice. And then by the following couple years, graduated in basically a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish with a minor of English. Because at that time, there wasn't really like a ESL program. There was one for more like teaching in K-12 through settings. But I knew I didn't want to teach in K-12 through just because of personal preference. Mm -hmm. I preferred more like the international side. So I kind of tried to take courses that were relevant. Um, did some kind of volunteering that helped me kind of determine, is this the career for me? Which was great, too, because the one class I had for global studies, the requirement was to volunteer in your community. And I volunteered for, um, it's a long name, uh, Lutheran Social Services Refugee Immigration Center. Okay. Where you basically teach English to incoming refugees, immigrants, or anyone that might be new to the country. And that opportunity really helped me kind of, you know, yeah, this is what I want to do for a career. And right? also you help the students, as you mentioned before, like yeah. in their art pre-orientation. Yeah, so I was always involved college. in international students and studies. Um, I even did a radio show like this, kind of similar mm -hmm. for a language group, right? There was the international coffee night, which I helped kind of get involved in. At some point, I just became more like a co-host by choice. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't have to, but I wanted to because it was a great place to meet people make connections, learn more about other people, where they come from, and why they're here. So yeah, I've always been involved in international situations and like communities, and I like that. So that also kind of maybe, yep, I want to do this for my career and continue with it. So, And that's how you made the transition to... Um, His natural side. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you made a move, it. correct? Yeah. You made a move yeah, to, so, mid, to the Midwest after that. Yep. So like I said, I keep going up and up. I remember like basically after I graduated, I moved to Sioux Falls, which is the largest city in South Dakota. Um, officially almost 200,000 for population now, according to the recent census. Um, so I kind of was working for my first year after uh, graduation because college courses, et cetera. I was still volunteering, and at some point during that time, I knew that I wanted to get my certification for teaching English abroad. There was a class in Minneapolis, so I did that for a brief month. And then when I came back, I got a job at the place where I was volunteering as a full-fledged beginning English teacher. Did that for a couple years, and eventually, again, it's one of those decisions you have to make for yourself. I'm like, am I going to stay here, or are there a better opportunity somewhere else? which I did, I found one in Minneapolis and I ended up moving to Minneapolis. So the next big city. But right? that, that job, I think, is one of the hardest one to be a beginner teacher because yeah. you take students from zero and it is hard for them to understand you. So you have to have a lot of skills yeah. to make them understand. Exactly. Because like different it's schools nice. I worked at are either like nonprofit schools or some that are more for profit universities, private language centers. Right. I think we talked about that difference too. And it is true. Like when you work in some cities or uh, some schools that are more nonprofit, some students you get are, you know, legitimate false beginners. They have no experience in the language, never had exposure possibly, or they might be an initial beginner where, yeah, they may listen to English somewhere here, mm -hmm. but never a formal study or to have people i specifically work with adults back in sioux falls for um harder LSS. my friend harder these are people who never even learned how to write in their own language yep. so i'd have people from like nepal who i mean of course their background never learned literacy in their own language so you have to take that into consideration when you're trying to teach this person new language a new cultural setting a new environment adjusting to usa you know all those fun stuff so it, it can be difficult right yeah because it is hard mm -hmm. for an adult to feel that really doesn't control anything and that don't know anything and yeah it is it is a hard job to be it the is. first one i think i will think about it if they offer me like just to teach beginners yeah because it is really hard well then i moved to minneapolis i was working for another nonprofit school right in my New school setting was basically more grassroots. I was teaching classes, I think, four days a week at this retirement home of, you know, former students that were from abroad, right? So I had a class of Russian-speaking grandmas and some Ethiopians because in that area of 
technically like St. Paul because the Twin Cities, right? Um, when I first entered the class, I was kind of like surprised and like, oh, these are all, you know, mature students who come from different backgrounds. Each has different kind of level of English because even when people tell me like, oh, I'm B1, B2, whatever, no one truly is that level. Or like when as a teacher, right, I teach a class of this level, people in that level are up in between, et cetera. It's not one level across. So the first day, just getting to know people and like, oh, we're from Belarus. We're from Russia, Ukraine, Mm -hmm. right? from Ethiopia, et cetera. So then getting used to the new students, what they need to learn, what do I need to teach them? Because when you work for a nonprofit, typically there are certain rules, policies you have to do and teach, Mm -hmm. especially if grants are involved. So even though I'm teaching um, a group of mature students who are retired, I still have to incorporate like job skills, which is a requirement from Minnesota for adult ESL learners, or do like occasional testing like mm-hmm. testing I did in high school for them, which they loved. Um, joke. <laughs> but what are know. what are the different? Because uh, I'm not sure that I know. Yeah. What are the different levels of learning a language? So I mean, level wise, it really determines or depends on kind of some factors of like what scale we're using. So I mean, think of the components when you learn a language. You have listening, reading, writing, Grammar. speaking. Grammar is considered a fifth. Most people say four, but there's five. Mm -hmm. Um, Those are some aspects you look into for a level. So depending on what kind of test procedure we're doing or what system we're using, that can correlate to a certain level, depending on how they do on a placement, a test, et cetera. So in Minnesota, I believe it's called CASA's testing. Um, but the level the levels go from one, two, three, yeah. four, five. Yeah, so you can go from like your beginner to like advanced or proficient. Well, the beginner would be what? Beginner is like I mean I know it. Cefr is mm-hmm. a zero, a one would be elementary. Okay, right. But yeah, it really it gets complex, and that's where it's harder because yes. you move yeah state different to state. standards, right? Different I states. I think in if I remember in Minnesota, it's like well technically it's like an A one, or they consider just as beginner, mm-hmm. right? So, but beginners zero is like you learn the numbers and yeah, the you day know of some the week. Very, very basic but A one, you can construct a sentence. Mm-hmm. You know more things, and yeah, just start from from that. Yeah, I. We used to. <laughs> I mean, right now I explain our students that because sometimes they they feel like they know more than the level they are, but. The idea to have them in a level, in a specific level, is that all their skills have to be like in the same level. Yeah. And sometimes they speak very well, but they really don't know the grammar. Mm-hmm. Or they are lacking some listening skills, but they speak very well and they believe that they are ready and yeah. they know English. And that's the idea to have them all in the same level, but with all their skills. Yeah, it's true. And then that's like you mentioned too, you'll have some people that have maybe higher speaking skills, lower literacy or the inverse. They have more literacy, less speaking. Oh, usually writing. They're better in writing and reading. Yeah. But when they are going to express themselves, it's like, uh, uh, uh. yeah. So as a teacher, I always learn how to address all those or like know your learners, right? What are their strengths? What are there some things they need to improve upon or need help with? Even though you teach one level, you have multi-levels within that Mm -hmm. level and have to dress and try to be able to teach everyone or even like, can they work together on these activities, these projects? So that's definitely a teacher skill. Is yes. Yeah. It's a, it's a challenge for them. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Um, like, like you shouty, my, my original language, my native language is Spanish. I, I, I was born here in Chicago Mm -hmm. But I grew up in Guatemala, Guatemala City, and I learned because I we moved when I was one years old, so I learned Spanish as my first language. I was only in in Guatemala City up to third grade. Um, so in terms of the Spanish language, in terms of grammar, obviously I only learned into uh, up into third grade. And while I'm sure, like you, Shouty, we had. English classes. Why well, I went to a Catholic school and I had English classes. I mean, it was very basic stuff. Yeah. Very basic. So when I moved 
back when I was 10, 9, 10 years old. I mean, even though like, you know, what's your name, that type of stuff, yeah. but it's, it's not conversational. I was not at a conversational right. level. So I came to the States. I was placed into, I want to say, fifth grade. But I couldn't be in a classroom because I didn't understand. Yeah. So then I was sent to a supposedly bilingual uh, class yeah. where, I mean, they were going over math and science and all this stuff. But, you know, all that stuff, I was well advanced exactly. in you were with lost. the exception of, right, with the exception of English. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, I, you know, how do I catch up? Yeah. Obviously, in you know, eventually once you get into... I think we're, I don't know if it was high school, you know, I took a Spanish class, but more so for the grammar and writing as opposed to learning, because as, as, as opposed to, you know, a child who's going to learn and pick up quicker as an adult, I'm, I'm sure it's a little bit, and you can tell me your experience, how difficult it is to pick it up or, or not to pick it up mm-hmm. to learn the language. No, but yeah, definitely. I, yeah. It I recall. The same. Like, I, I, was studying English uh-huh. back home before I came, and I was in intermediate level. Yeah. <laughs> and no, no. When I arrived here, I I knew how to write <laughs> sentences, but it's not a, a paragraph. It's different. Yeah. <laughs> not a paragraph had, at all. Yeah. It was super challenging because I thought I was. And if what? you say intermediate level, I mean you know English, <laughs> but no, I was totally lost. I, yeah. I used to start like, yeah. Lower intermediate, like B1, yeah. but no. Well, even <laughs> like volunteering, like back in my university town, because that was those, you know, side projects to you, the volunteering as you study, like some schools I went to very similar to UGO. It's like, okay, I am assigned to this school, this uh, middle school. I'm helping a student from Mexico kind of adjust. Mm-hmm. Very similar. They place them into like these special, I mean, not special classes, but like this is a language yeah. class mm-hmm. to improve. And this one child I was working with, he was from Mexico and like he understands the material. He just can't do it in English. Mm-hmm. And like the teacher's like, hey, we try to talk to the parents, but they don't speak English. So you have to be that middle person and yeah. translate what are parent teacher conferences? What do the grades mean? You know, usually the parents, the bit, mo- most important question is like, how is my child doing? Of course, parents, right? Mm-hmm. Like, hey, you know, he's doing well. He understands material. We just need to practice writing in English and that's it. So it gave me more insight because, like, I don't have that similar background. Like, mm-hmm. if you ask me about learning grammar, the only time I recall learning English grammar was, like, maybe eighth grade. And yeah. we used, like, these old textbooks from, like, the 80s mm-hmm. and, like, do a lot of the underlining sentences, parsing, which is very mm-hmm. not the most uh, up-to-date method. And that's the only time I recall actually studying grammar in English despite yeah. that I, you know, grew up in USA and such. Mm-hmm. But... And I, the same, I feel that because, well, I grew up in Venezuela, so I know. And also I study um, journalism, and so I know grammar. But here I heard Spanish. I listened to mm-hmm. Spanish speakers that were born here, yeah. and they are lacking grammar skills. Yeah. But they speak Spanish yeah. or some pronunciation and things like that. Yeah. So... You that study Spanish also. <laughs> uh-huh. For a good <laughs> majority of my life, maybe, <laughs> right? We are here. And we are three Spanish speakers, yeah. I guess. I'd so. say, like, how long? So I did two years of Spanish in high school, which at that time, like, it was very basic Spanish. I don't think it's even level specific. Mm-hmm. I wanted to take it just because I wanted to learn the language for once because I had the opportunity. Um, Afterwards, like fast forward like back to when I was in university and then took Spanish again. Like, well, I can remember these concepts, the very basic stuff. Grammar wasn't the best because of prior. We didn't really learn grammar. We just read books that were for children, right? But in an, in elementary school or high school, do you think it's still basic Spanish? Like we, we learn basic English in yeah. our country, but do you learn here basic Spanish? It's very basic. Like I remember in high school, when we start learning about verb and conjugations, which at first I never heard of before, it's like, what's a conjugation? And then of course we do it, but in high school I specifically remember, okay, we're gonna do your basics, but we're not gonna learn about vosotros because we don't use it here. And mm-hmm. like, well, okay. Which looking back didn't really help because later when I did a study abroad in Spain where they use vosotros yeah. a lot, luckily, like when I went to university, 
my wonderful teachers, shout out to them at Modern Language Department, uh, retaught me things that I didn't know or like helped kind of, this is the actual Spanish you need to know, not just your specific grammatical Spanish. But it's in the university level where yeah. you think Spanish become like more formal. Yeah. So I remember know. in university, we learned more like, okay, it's, you know, you have your general Spanish But then again, I remember the advice I was given, like once you learn enough to feel confident, you kind of need to pick a region, right? Are you going to study more Spanish in Spain? Are you going to study more like Spanish in Mexico, Argentina, right? Mm -hmm. And my one professor gave me that advice, like pick a region and stick to it. Because if you decide to learn all the regions, it's going to be very difficult, which is true. So that's why eventually when I did my study abroad in Spain, the bulk of it that I had the real practice with is, you know, Spain, Spanish, which is hard to like determine what that is. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I would say like looking back from high school, people who study Spanish today, especially about my friends who do like Spanish immersion school back in Sioux Falls, I think they learn more general Spanish that can be used for all Spanish speakers because once you start to advance again, you have to kind of choose where do you want to focus on? Right. So, which like in my mind, we don't think of that in English that for like, do you know American English or do you know British English when there's a whole global English concept or there's mm -hmm. more people who speak English as a second or third language than native speakers. So, yeah. Got it. So then how did you make your transition from Minnesota to Chicago? Moving up and up. Right. So <laughs> at that point, I think after about a year or so in Minneapolis, um, There was an opportunity to teach English at Kaplan here in Chicago. So I was like, wow, you know, this is a really like, it, like Kaplan was a big school, et cetera. Um, so I did that, applied, got the job in 2018 when I first moved to Chicago. And then, yeah, I went from teaching more from the nonprofit to more for like a private language center, which gave me more of the international pr perspective because by then teaching English at Kaplan, these are students that are of course, more knowledgeable. They're recent graduates from like bachelors or masters or they're just tourists, right? So give you more of a different perspective on the international side or like when I was in university, the students I'm talking to now are just like the people I had back in my university. The only difference is now I'm the teacher mm -hmm. or administration right. basically. So how'd you find your way to MCC? It's moving on up and up, right? <laughs> There was a, unique position available and I decided I'm going to take it because I got the experience and skills and you know even though I started as a teacher at Kaplan 2018 at some point I kind of transitioned to more administration which I kind of liked a little bit more because on the admin side of things you're more involved with students not just the students in your classroom right mm -hmm. um, and even though I was doing admin at you know Kaplan I was still able to teach here and there or like get to know people and make those connections even when people finished. Yep. So when I saw this position at MCC, I was kind of like, you know what? It's a great opportunity. It gives me more side to help people who are applying from abroad, right? People who are transferring, doing change of status, right? And I have experience in that since I did admissions prior at Kaplan as well. So that's kind of why I came here. And also like I've knew of, I've known of Midwestern for a while. So moving on up. Awesome. Yeah, we talked about <clears throat> well, obviously, I learned English at a different age. You know, yeah. I was younger, shouty, a little bit older. We've talked a little bit about that. Um, that there's really no age to learn. Mm. Right? Oh, yeah. And I'm sure, aside from the diversity that we have here, uh, we have age diversity as well. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I've had, I mean, people always ask me, like, okay, you teach adults, but like, what ages do you teach or what's the youngest? What's the oldest? Right. The youngest, I'd probably say, like, I know at one point we had, like, 15-year-olds or, like, 14-year-olds. Or, again, I was doing volunteer work in elementary schools, middle schools. So these are people who are, like, eight. My favorite is the one student I had back in, like, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, she was Russian. She was, like, 104. Wow. Learning English. And, you know, I still tell this story because when people say, you know, I'm too old to learn language... Well, I had a student who was 104. I can't believe that. I checked. I At first, I was kind of like, maybe it's like, maybe it's a different ID mm -hmm. or verification. Mm -hmm. I checked. It's 104. <laughs> And then, yeah, she was very unique. Despite that she had a hearing awesome. aid, she can still participate. She yeah. learned. 
So having that mindset kind of changed my perspective. Mm-hmm. Like you're not that old or, or you, like, you can learn at any age. It's no excuse. It's your own excuse. And yeah, she started probably learning at 90. Where she, she was from? Uh, Russia. So she, in 90, she became a published author. She wrote some articles for like a Russian magazine, I think. And then, awesome. then she just learned English because that was the opportunity. Um, so, yeah, she participated despite age being a factor, health, et cetera. I mean, she she mm-hmm. can hear the hearing aid and like she would still come to class. So that kind of made me more inspired. Like, you know what? Mm-hmm. I can do this. You can do this. Or anytime a student Sweet. tells me I can't, I'm too old. No, you're not. Try it. Put the effort into it. Or like think of reasons wow. of why you don't want to do it. Right. Right. Or how to teach yourself better. Mm-hmm. So. I'm speechless. <laughs> I'm, I mean, as soon as we finish, I'm going to start yeah. uh, writing my book. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do it. I mean, students, listen, man. Listen, man. <laughs> you have to come to classes. I mean, no excuses. Learn English. Learn any language. Do you think... Learning a new language is definitely a plus, but how make you as a person, I don't know, like uh, that open mind yeah. is, I don't know, learning a new language, yeah. open your mind in different ways. Yeah, I talked to a friend about this and we were talking about like our experiences because we both did something similar when languages, you know, and her background is more in French. It's more like, okay, learning a new language is like opening a new door to yourself mm-hmm. and think of your personality, like, how are, you, how are you when you speak Spanish? How are you when you speak English? How do you act when you speak French, right? So it definitely does open doors and does open your perspective and kind of can change in a way, right? Because I remember even when I came back from studying Spain, my mom's like, you sound different. Like, well, okay, I just came back from a different country where the language is not technically English as a native language. So, of course, I'm adjusting, right? Right. But yeah, it does change your just even friends I talk to or people who maybe know me before. I'm like, oh, you talk different, but not in a bad way. More mm-hmm. like, okay, you talk in a way that's more easy to understand. Like you'll have been teaching for the last quite a few years. Mm-hmm. So yeah, definitely. And as well, like how do you incorporate that? Right. A lot of students would ask like, how can I learn listening? How can I learn this? What are some things you do every day? Like when you go home, what's the first thing you do? I watch Netflix. Okay. How about you watch something English in Netflix language. in English or whatever language you're learning? Subtitles. Yeah. I mean, my favorite is like the friends method where mm-hmm. I think this uh, Korean band on the Ellen show are saying like, we learned English through friends. My sister did that. Yeah. I've got friends who've done this. <laughs> With extra classes. But I have a friend who learned all his English from basically TV shows. And like the way you could do it is very similar. Watch the whole series, English, or maybe in your language with subtitles. Watch it again, put English subtitles. Watch it a third time in English, no subtitles. And you could, I've tried it myself, but it's hard because sometimes I watch shows where I know the the actor's voice Mm -hmm. and I hear a different voice. It's hard. Yeah. Now, both of you, obviously, Shouty, you participated in uh, part of your ESL program here at MCC. Now, you're you're the manager for the um, admissions. What Mm -hmm. are some of the... uh, highlights about our programs or what differentiates our program versus others? Well, I will say like coming from other schools I've worked at, there's more flexibility, right? Um, That's a plus. The classes you take here are definitely useful depending on what your, your goal is. Because like we mentioned, some classes are level based, right? But a typical thing at most schools is like, what happens after you finish levels, right? Where do I go next? So at MCC, you have options for that. If they complete the levels, they can do professional English and academic English is great for like university prep. Or if they really want to, they can transition towards associate programs, which are great because that's usually what most of my students in the past would do is they would apply to university, a master's program. But depending how that goes, like and admissions itself, but at MCC, you have the options for the business programs. You've got accounting. There's even health programs. So to me and to all the schools I worked in the past, there's more opportunities for international students than just, okay, English is done, move on. Mm-hmm. You actually can stay at MCC and continue with something, mm-hmm. which is great. Right. Usually our students already had um, 
a career mm -hmm. in their countries. Their their bachelors are from their country, or they already has a master. Mm -hmm. But our associates complement all of that, yeah. and it's a way to don't stop and or get stuck. Like, okay, I learned English, but now mm -hmm. what? As you as yeah. you are saying, so it is. Yeah, MCC has a good options. Yeah, I've had students who, you know, in Chicago go from one English school to the other and the other. And like, you know, that's great. But at some point you kind of have to do something more productive and worth your time and value because, I mean, you're learning English for the sixth time at this school. It's great. But maybe if you want to do something like marketing, mm -hmm. right, that's a great option to get that associate's an entry level requirement. You could potentially either look for a job or possibly do an internship or at MCC there's also the options for CPT, OPT, right? Which is great as well because you can get work experience as a student. So it builds towards like a future path, which and is great. Also like when you feel like you learn English, mm -hmm. I mean, we never stop learning a language. Yeah. This is definitely that I can speak by myself because yeah. I got at some point like, I don't want to write an essay anymore <laughs> or do the same like uh -huh. we do in ESL uh, uh, programs. So when, when MCC opened the business program, I immediately did the, I switched to that mm. program. So I still continue learning English, but I was, I feel that I was advancing. It was a, a different level. Yeah. But we never stop learning the language. Yeah. I'm still making mistakes. I'm mistakes. Right. Same. Like everyone. <laughs> but that's my favorite. Like when you learn a language, my favorite thing is always like, okay, even though you make mistakes, you learn that way. Right. Yeah. Cause I even really in my background, mistakes. I've made many mistakes in Spanish, but like those are funny mistakes to me because again, yeah. like it's a language difference. Mm -hmm. Right. And that helps you learn, or at least you remember that better than trying to memorize 2000 words. That's the, Mm -hmm. To each their own, but to me, it's just easier to learn by actually doing it versus just like studying over and over these vocabs yes. that you might not use. Or if you work for a business situation or a degree of some sort, you're using the English skills or language skills you have in an actual real life situation, which is more that practical use. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Sometimes I correct myself, sometimes yeah. no, but this life, this is my English, mm -hmm. and it's okay. It is. It, yes. I think the, the most important thing is is to be able to do it. Go yeah. out, enroll, wherever it is. Yeah. S just start. No fear. Once you get started, you know, yeah. you find yourself and, and, and you get the confidence to be able to, to do something. Mm -hmm. um, we're wrapping up. Anything else you have in mind? It's the Q&A portion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have quick, quick questions here. No, no, we don't have. <laughs> it is uh, awesome it is awesome to have you here yeah yeah welcome where where do you see the program going the esl program going well i know that we're looking at more abroad applicants and we are getting more people from abroad applying which is great because i mean again there's opportunities that people have and maybe they didn't know of or like again people looking to have the opportunity to study abroad maybe advance their career or at least get more of insight of what they can do when they're here, that's a great option. So that's great for me because again, some of these countries, like for example, um, Colombia, of course, mm -hmm. which most of my friends are Colombia on that side. I mean, there's opportunities and that's a great way to kind of start. What are the world. countries that uh, Top represent countries? our students I'd here? say now definitely Colombia, Brazil, Mongolia, which to me is unique because Every school I worked at, there's always this unique group of students, which you didn't expect, but then you see some Mongolians. Mm -hmm. I've gotten to know more and more. Um, I've seen more for Turkmenistan, right? Yes, my people. <laughs> <laughs> I so love yeah, Turkmenistan. Exactly. Like I haven't really had like very, um, I would say countries that are not common until now. I'm like, wow, I'm getting more applicants from Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. Mm -hmm. um, of course, my Colombians, Venezuelans as well. Right. So yeah, I haven't met some Venezuelans here. Yeah. yeah. It's my favorite. You can try to like listen to like Venezuelan Spanish. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we thought that we didn't have any accent. Uh, uh. <laughs> everyone has one. So like everyone has their we, own we, accent we of some sort. Like singing. Yeah. 
if you ever watch like the fun videos for English, I just watched one maybe a couple of days ago. It was a person who is from Wisconsin versus Minnesota. It's like your typical Midwestern states. There are some features mm-hmm. that are different or like vowels are differently pronounced or it might be some variance here and there. Even like me, when someone asked me or told me like, you have an accent back at university. I was like, what do you mean? Say your state, South Dakota. I'm like, oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> then you can hear it gets the O, right? So I don't know. I can get that. <laughs> yeah, it's I mean, you can kind of pick it up here and there. But if I were go, if I were to go to like maybe West coastal states or like New York, et cetera, they might pick up like Midwestern. But in my defense, I think Midwestern English accents are kind of easier to understand. They're neutral. We don't have any kind of like difficult to understand features. But maybe yeah, old school our, Chicago. Our probably U.S. accents are easier than say, mm. you know, Irish. Yeah. Accents. Or like I remember one <laughs> or class Scottish I taught, accents. Th- those are extremely a, difficult. I had students try to like pretend. Okay, you want to pretend you are. A, a real New Yorker. I want to hear your best impression of someone from New York. And they would, you know, I would play a video so to like kind of help Italian? them. Something kind like of. That. I mean, like coffee, like those things, right? We'd watch a video first and they kind of practice. Okay. I had a, in college, there was a, you know, classmate that was from, from England. I can't remember, you know, which mm-hmm. part of England, but there were times that I, I did not, I could not understand what he was oh, saying. Yeah. It was just like a, Say that again, please. <laughs> yeah, I've had coworkers too that on the like you know the UK side of things. And one guy came over to visit for like a work event. There were a few times I was kind of like, "What? Mm-hmm. What did you ask me for?" Because again, the expressions are different. Yeah. And fun fact: it's usually vowels are different among English. So like, mm-hmm. rather they speak some sort of British variety, North American variety, it's the vowels that are primarily going to be different. Mm-hmm. If it's not vowels, it's probably going to be like maybe some phrases, verbs, nouns, just like in Spanish too. Mm-hmm. So, I I have a well, I have I run the conversation club in, here <laughs> at MCC just to also challenge myself. Mm-hmm. But we discussed this week that um, one of our students she said that she couldn't understand the teacher. Uh, and I told her, don't worry, you will get used to. Because of her, uh, she said, because of her accent. Mm-hmm. And I said, don't worry. We have an advantage that nobody has. We know how to understand English from international people. It's yeah. like we recognize the words that coming from an Asian, from a person from, I don't know, Turkmenistan. This is unique. Yeah. I always put the example of my sister because she learning English. She is also a English teacher, but she is also always around Americans. Yeah. When an international student or something are close to me and talk to me, she always asks me like, I didn't get anything. Yeah. <laughs> Just a few words. I said, I understood everything yeah. because I think this is an advantage. Yeah. Similar to me, like after teaching a while, like you kind of learn how to understand, you know, if that person doesn't feel confident. My favorite are the people like, sorry for my English. Like you spoke fine. I understood. I understood everything. Yeah. You do not need to apologize. Or people who are just too nervous and instead mm-hmm. will like, we'll show you the phone screen and like Google translate. And like, hey, it's okay. I mean, I've taught for yeah. 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, I can kind of understand what you're saying or I'm used to it. Correct. So yeah, I think a lot of it is just fear, I think. Yeah. Fear of not sounding correctly or fear of Making whatever. Errors. You just got to yeah, get, yeah. get over that fear. Yeah. So... I think it's been a, I really enjoyed the conversation. I think it's been a wonderful conversation. Talking a little bit about everything, mainly Spanish and ESL. Until the next one. (laughs) Until the next one. Yeah, we should do another one. Panel discussion. Why not? Yes. yes. So I want to thank both the co-host, Shouty, for being here, and Ryan, our uh, ESL admissions manager. I think it's, it's a great conversation. Hopefully you gave some good insight into what it is to come to Chicago, the Midwestern Career College, to learn a language, and uh, many other things. So I want to remind the listeners to follow us at uh, Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and write to us at podcast.mccollins.edu. And we look forward to talking to you next time. Thank you, guys. Thank Thank you. you.